So many things in life involve taking a risk. Even something as common as walking out the door each morning involves some risk. Lots of people find taking risks scary. We like to play it safe. But sometimes the risk, taking the first step, is the very thing we need to do in order to move our lives forward. Well, today, you're going to meet one man who has taken many risks in life and they've paid off. Dr. Ben Carson went from humble beginnings to becoming one of the most extraordinary neurosurgeons in the world. And he's going to share how he seeks God's wisdom to help him manage risks. It has stood the test of time. God's book, the Bible, still relevant in today's complex world. It is written, sharing hope around the globe. Our world has plenty of dangers, doesn't it? Plenty of things to be afraid of. And it's not just the big things like terrorism out there and wars building up. It's the smaller, closer things. Will I have a job? How will I pay my bills? And the safety of my family? Now, generally speaking, our society is focused on minimizing risks and maximizing safety. We have all kinds of rules and regulations aimed at keeping dangers at a distance and protecting the customer. Well, in one sense, that's a good thing. There are people out there who take the wrong risks. Some are experimenting with drugs. Some are risking all their money on a new business venture. And others may be thinking of changing their careers. But most of us, by far, tend to avoid risks. We run from them. We stay in our comfort zone. And all too often, we just can't move forward. We're stuck. We can't take the next step because there's a little jump involved. So today, we're going to look at a basic question. What's a good risk? What's a bad risk? And how do you tell the difference? Well, I'd like you to meet a man who's taken many risks in his life. Dr. Ben Carson is one of the world's greatest neurosurgeons. He became famous for being the first person to separate conjoined twins. This was a kid who grew up in a violent, impoverished inner city. So how did he go from this to being the director of paediatric neurosurgery at John Hopkins Hospital by the age of 33? Well, inner city Detroit, wasn't so bad in the beginning. And then my parents got divorced. And uh, that thrust us uh, into the middle of severe poverty. Uh, we actually moved from inner city Detroit to inner city Boston after a few years back to Detroit, but in very different circumstances in the ghetto. Uh, no money, rats, roaches, sirens, gangs, murders. Both of my older cousins who we adored were killed. Um, so it was a, a pretty dismal uh, situation. And uh, a lot of people who were discouraging, always talking about the systems against you, this is against you, that's against you, you can't do this, you can't do that. But the thing that probably was the worst thing is that I didn't think that I was very smart. And uh, no one else thought I was smart either. So, you know, they called me names and you know, that just made me retreat more uh, into my own world. And uh, also I had a very horrible temper. And uh, fortunately for me, you know, my mother believed in me and made me read books. And that is what really allowed me to escape that horrible environment. You know, between the covers of those books, I could go anywhere, I could be anybody, I could do anything. and. Uh, no longer was the Detroit a confinement to me. The whole world became the stage for me. And I began to think about all the things I could do, not the things that I couldn't do. And uh, even though I had uh, what many would consider a very challenging childhood, um, that didn't have to affect who I became. You know, one of the books I read early on was a book called Up From Slavery. It was the autobiography of Booker T. Washington. He was born a slave. 
It was illegal for slaves to read, but he taught himself to read anyway. Read everything he could get his hands on and became an advisor to two U.S. presidents. And, uh, you know, that said to me that you can make your own self valuable. So, you know, I really just started changing the way that I did things. In high school, most of the kids would be happy uh, when they didn't have to do the lesson that day because the teacher spent the whole hour disciplining people. I wasn't happy when that happened. I would go back after school and I would talk to that teacher. And I would say, what were you planning to teach? And they would be delighted to see me. And I got involved in a lot of extracurricular activities. And uh, those are the kinds of things that prepared me to go from an inner city high school in Detroit to Yale University. But again, you come back and you emphasize the personal responsibility. I think that's what really makes the difference. And even as a intern, as a resident, as a young attending physician, you know, I saw those patients as my responsibility. And that meant, you know, if there wasn't a good solution, finding a good solution. So that's why I would sometimes push the envelope and maybe do things that were a little avant-garde, but uh, recognizing that if you didn't do them, the patient was gonna die. For years, he's had an influence on many people through his writing and speaking, and has helped many people become more successful and unleash their potential for excellence. But there's one thing he sees that keeps coming up time and time again as an obstacle. People have problems with risks. Almost everyone has. And this is what stops them from moving forward. Moving forward into the big plan, the plan which Dr. Carson believes God has for our lives. And that is why he wrote the book, Take the Risks. So how do we know what is a good risk or a bad risk? How do we know when it's time to move forward in our lives? Well, you know, I have uh, prepared a, a little, a simple algorithm um, involving four questions. What's the best thing that happens if I do this? What's the best thing that happens if I don't do this? And uh, what's the worst thing that happens if I do this? And what's the worst thing that happens if I don't do this? And, and when I ask those four questions, it provides great clarity to almost any situation, not only in medicine, but in lots of different areas. A, a group of marine biologists wrote to me and said, uh, you know, we use your little formula because we were having a terrible problem with sharks and baby seals and, you know, the whole ecology and how do we handle things. And we use your questions and it told us exactly what we needed to do and it worked. <laughs> Now, in order to use that, it is very important to know yourself because you'll answer that question differently uh, depending on who you are. For instance, if the most important thing to you is your reputation, you're gonna answer those questions differently. Uh, you know, if I do this and it fails and everybody's gonna be criticizing, well, you know, if that's, the top of your list, you answer that question differently than you do if this is my patient and I need to do everything in my power to make sure that they're okay. There is nothing that even comes close to the relationship with God in my life in terms of, of giving you perspective uh, and providing wisdom. And I constantly ask God for wisdom uh, because I think that's the most important thing. Knowledge is maybe a close second. It's very, very important. But if you don't have wisdom, then you don't know how to apply the knowledge. And you will become what I call an educated fool. Uh, so it's really that relationship that has guided me. A lot of times when I would run into very, very difficult situations, uh, I would simply turn them over to him and say, Lord, this one is, is beyond my capabilities. Uh, would you step in? I remember uh, one time, uh, it was in, a, in South Africa. It was a very complex case of conjoined twins. And we had reached a point in the operation where 
We just couldn't figure out what to do. It was too complex. There were too many blood vessels. They were going in every different direction. And I just said, Lord, you know, I've reached my extremity. There's nothing else I can do. And um, I kind of went blank for a little while. I don't remember what happened over the next several hours. But the other neurosurgeons, after the case was over, said to me, we were watching you and we could not believe what you were doing. I really think the Lord just took over at that point. And um, so, you know, I, I ask him for wisdom in everything I do, not just in medicine, but, you know, in the rest of my public life, in my public speaking, writing, um, our scholarship program, which has just blossomed, all kinds of things. Because if, if he's in the center of it, I guarantee you it's going to be successful. Having God in his life has had a big impact on Dr. Ben Carson. It's helped him to identify, choose, and live with acceptable risk in his life. The God of heaven is big enough and powerful enough to deflate our fears. The God of heaven can get them down to a manageable size. So it's very helpful to fill our mind with his promises in the Bible. Focus on God, his ability, and his power. God can help people who feel like they're in a rut to look up from their world because he communicates his own unrestricted presence. God pushes people to see a bigger picture, to overcome their problems so they can look outward and escape the tangle of their own problems and move forward, even to the extent of helping others. Often our fears boil down to this, what we think about the most. What we usually dwell on makes an enormous amount of difference. Our success in dealing with fear will depend on which is the bigger in our minds, the danger out there or the God in here. It's simple. If we fret over possible tragedies more than divine promises, then the danger will loom larger. Yes, God can definitely be our refuge, our fortress. That's a beautiful, reassuring picture of our mighty Lord. We find refuge under His wings. His faithfulness is like a shield. He is the one who can deflate those familiar terrors of the night. Listen to what it says in the Bible here in Psalms 27 and verse 1. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? Uh, I can tell you that prayer has a tremendous impact. And, you know, there have been many difficult uh, situations where I went to him and just asked him for wisdom, for direction. And he provides that uh, sometimes in the form of other people. He, he puts someone in your life who can help you with the solution. And I remember the case of the first set of conjoined twins, the Bender twins. Uh, and I'm trying to figure out how do you keep them from bleeding to death? And I happened to be talking to a friend of mine who was the chief of cardiothoracic surgery. And he started talking about how they used hypothermic arrest. Uh, basically shut off the blood. Uh, and you have a period of time in an infant up to an hour where you can operate on them before you have to restore the blood flow and start the heart back up. And that was the missing link. That was the thing that I, I couldn't do it without that piece of information. And uh, so I, I can recount many uh, such situations like that where you know, the Lord speaks to you in lots of different ways, and sometimes it's by bringing the right people into your life at the right time. God has helped Dr. Ben Carson with his confidence and with taking risks. It's true. We don't have to remain afraid. We don't have to sit there and let our fears inflate the risky things around us. Paul gave his disciple Timothy some very relevant advice in 2 Timothy chapter 1 
and verse 7. For God did not give us a spirit of timidity, but a spirit of power, of love and of self-discipline. God wants us to look at certain challenges, certain risks with His power and self-discipline. Fears can either drive us into a shell or force us to expand our circle. The difference is whether we allow God's expansiveness to work through us. All too often, our perspective is limited. There are things in our past that can narrow our point of view. There are disappointments that can keep us down. There are hurts that keep us from looking in a certain direction. But God is higher than all that. His ways are more inspiring. And God offers to share His thoughts, His mindset with each of us. He wants to give us His perspective. And that's a huge advantage when we make decisions. So don't just huddle in your fears. Don't just back away any time a challenge comes up. Instead, get close to Christ. Ask for His Spirit. Pray for His wisdom. And then you can take a good look at the pros and cons to determine which way to go with much more confidence. True wisdom comes from God and He readily wants to impart His wisdom to you when you ask in faith. That's a big reason why Dr. Ben Carson made such great decisions. That's why he moved so far from an inner city ghetto life to a world famous neurosurgeon. But some of us have taken risks in the past and they haven't turned out well. Maybe you've experienced failure and are too scared to take a risk again. Well, through God's power, you can move past those mistakes and continue pushing forward to the bright future God has in store for you. Failures are really only learning experiences. You know, Thomas Edison, who invented the light bulb, said he knew 999 ways a light bulb did not work. So if he'd given up after each time, we wouldn't have had a light bulb today. So. You'll find that to be the case with, with many people who are highly successful. You talk to them about how they got there. Virtually every one of them will tell you about a string of failures. But the key was they learned from the failure. If you learn every time you fail, you're going to be a lot further ahead than those people who just give up as soon as something doesn't work. I can share uh, many stories, but I remember one in particular, uh, a little girl from New Mexico who was in status epilepticus. That means she was having seizures 24-7, was on a ventilator because she couldn't control her breathing, was paralyzed on one side, hadn't spoken for months, and uh, no one knew what to do. And the mother heard about some of the work we were doing at Johns Hopkins with cerebral hemispherectomy, an operation in which we remove half the brain in children uh, in appropriate cases to stop intractable seizures. And she made contact with us and arrangements were made to bring the girl up on a medical transport. I and some of my colleagues felt that she was a good candidate for that operation, even though she was older than most of the patients. Uh, there was a neurologist who was very, very famous who adamantly disagreed and, you know, wrote letters to the dean, the president of the hospital, the departmental chairman. You cannot let Carson do this. We'll look like loose cannons. Other well-respected experts had weighed in on this, and uh, this is not the right thing to do. And uh, then he made a mistake. He went to an international conference uh, in Italy and left a patient there in the hospital, and I said, this is our big chance. And after prayerful consideration, I, I talked the mom into having the operation done. And when he came back from Italy, she was off the ventilator for the first time in two months. The seizures had stopped. She was starting to move the paralyzed side, and he never had another negative thing to say. And that was a case in which I did the BWA, best, worst analysis. Best thing, worst thing, best thing, worst thing. And uh, in doing that, and in seeking God's wisdom, it was clear that the only chance that this little girl had 
was you were going to have to be proactive. You were going to have to do something. But I also am quick to add that I always pray. I always ask God for wisdom. He created the human body, and therefore he knows how to fix it. And uh, if you're in sync with his wisdom, you're likely to be much further ahead. And he will never let you down. If you ask him and you believe, he will not forsake you. Dr. Ben Carson's remarkable experiences and career shows us that there are some very good risks in life. There are those little steps that can take you to a much better place. And the God of the Bible is such a big part of Dr. Ben Carson's life and a big part of his success. And this same God can help you and me to make the right choices by examining challenges in a much clearer way. Yes, God is an excellent resource to have around you, especially when you're thinking about what risks to take. So please, start making an investment in God. Start spending more time getting to know Him. Start absorbing more of His mindset from the Bible. God is a great teacher. You can learn such valuable things. Will you open up to God as we pray? Dear Father, thank you for being there for us as a fortress, as a source of wisdom. Help us now throw all our fears into your everlasting arms. Help us begin taking in more of your wisdom. We want to open our minds and hearts to the spirit of Jesus Christ. We want to widen our lives in his way. In Jesus' name, amen. If you've been inspired by this week's program, be sure to join us again next week when It Is Written will present another new and thought-provoking perspective on the peace, insight, understanding and hope that only the Bible can give us. It Is Written truly is changing lives around the world. Until next week, remember, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God.